Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Quick note before we begin, the Finding Genius Foundation, as part of the Finding Genius Podcast, has recently completed a book about understanding viruses. So the creation of this book was to interview a 100 virologists, ask them a lot of deep, difficult questions, take the most difficult questions, and then re-interview the top 25 or so and ask them the hardest questions I could think of. And we compiled that all into a book. So you'll see question and four or five experts' answers. Question, four or five experts' answers. There's about 30 questions in the book. I think it's a great read for the layperson and for the researcher. It talks about a lot of speculation in the world of viruses, such as are they alive or not? And why is it important? Uh, why do viruses go latent or hidden or ineffective or sit in a person or an animal or another creature for weeks, months, years, and then suddenly become virulent and affect that person? Uh, so there's a lot of really provocative questions in the book. It's now on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon and type in Finding Genius, you'll see the book on viruses. It's also on Kindle. If you want to go and order it now, uh, you can do so again by going to Amazon or Kindle. Or go go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org and go to Publications. There's an opportunity as well to get the transcripts of all the interviews and to hear the original interviews themselves. If we had put them all together, the book would be about a thousand pages, but we condensed them down to make it juicy and concise and tight and very interesting. So I hope you'll check out the book. Uh, we're now working on one about cancer, but this is going to be our goal is uh, three times a year to come out with these masterclass books that I think will inspire new scientific research, and I hope you'll check it out. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Maurice Chung. Uh, he's the co-founder of Prairie Health, and we're going to talk about uh, what they do there at Prairie. I, I won't bungle it. I'll have him describe it. So, Maurice, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me on. Uh, happy to describe what we're doing over at Prairie. Yeah, yeah, please tell me the premise of Prairie. Yeah, at Prairie, our goal is using data to drive better outcomes in psychiatry, meaning bringing more data to the first line of care and reducing trial and error using evidence-based practices. So what that looks like in practice today is we're live here in California and manage the patient life cycle from the point of diagnosis through treatment through remission and use data to inform that entire care process. Once the patient comes on board, we run a pharmacogenomics test, which helps give us more insight into patient drug metabolism and pharmacokinetics, uh, which helps us make more informed dosing decisions and prevent the use of genetically incongruent medication. We also use machine learning on large phenotypic data sets to better understand how people like this patient have responded to medication in the past and what tools we can use to improve the accuracy uh, probabilistically of first-line prescriptions for this given patient. Right, so what does that mean? What's an example of a specific case? Not with a person's name, but, you know, let someone's going to be on an SSRI, let's say Wellbutrin, you know, I don't know, they're a 25-year-old female. What would you look for to determine whether they're going to do well on the drug or not? Yeah. So first we look at their pharmacogenomic panel, looking at their C CYP, you know, the P450s, uh, to better understand how this patient metabolizes medication. And certainly pharmacogenomic science isn't everything, uh, but right now it can tell us a whole lot that we don't know about how patients metabolize medication. And that can give us a better understanding of, hey, we know this patient is a, you know, is a rapid metabolizer for Wellbutrin. That's going to inform our dosing decisions. That's going to inform uh, the way we go about treatment. So that's one piece of it. The other piece is, you know, most of these medications were developed before the NIH Revitalization Act in 1993, which mandated that women minorities, people of color, be included in these clinical trials. So you have all these medications with dosing guidelines, with clinical trials, with side effect profiles built on people who aren't actually using the medications most today. So what we can do is we can look at large phenotypic data sets and say, you know, out of millions of other people, someone who looks like you with the same family medical history profile, with the same, same sex, same race, same you know, same 
kind of symptomatology profile, you know, how have they responded to this medication in the past? And we view that almost as probabilistic medicine, so to speak, and saying, you know, using this machine learning tool, we can understand how outcomes are correlated with phenotype. Uh, and that can give us a better understanding for what medication to start. Well, if women and other you know people weren't included in these clinical trials, like let's focus on women so they have a cycle, you know, usually a monthly cycle unless they're in menopause, um, how does that affect these medications? And have any of the drug makers gone back to collect data or cats out of the bag, the medicine's out there, oh well. It's a great question. So we have 20, 30 years of longitudinal real world data from healthy HRs, from phenotypic records that are, you know, kind of kept as clinical free text across kind of longitudinal data sets. In the United States, they're particularly poor because the EHRs are so fragmented. You have one health system, you have another health system, and all the data is siloed and not interoperable. So that makes it hard to see what a long longitudinal patient trajectory is. However, if you look at a unified health system, even like the VA in the United States, which is kind of an, an exception, or in the UK at the NHS, or other kind of nationalized health systems, you actually can reconstruct longitudinal patient trajectories by understanding how they have responded to medication over time. And now that we have 20 plus years of that data, we're really in a unique position to apply deep learning, to apply NLP techniques to those data sets, to extract outcomes, to extract medication, to extract phenotypic profiles, so that we can better understand how the phenotype relates to medication response. And that's something that, you know, drug makers, you know, today, A, don't have a super strong incentive to do, given that most of the medications are on generic. And B, uh, it's something that's really hard to recreate with real world evidence, you know, kind of in the current, the current environment in the United States. So I think there's multiple reasons why the data that we kind of originally used to develop these guidelines around SSRIs are no longer relevant for for the kinds of populations that are actually using these medications today. So what do you have to do to improve upon this? Are you using your own AI systems or your own anecdotal data? Like, What do you do? So there's two things, right? Like one is on the genetic side. We can use that data to make more informed dosing decisions. And we have that data today. Uh, and we look to CPIC, we look to farm GKB, we look towards gold standard evidence, Dutch pharmacogenomics to guide to, to you know, provide that information to clinicians so that they are empowered with better tools to make those decisions. So that's one piece, right? And the second piece is, you know, we now have the ability to work with clinical free text data sets in a way that we weren't able to before, given advances in NLP, largely in other, other areas. You know, we have only recently seen the utility of NLP in cancer kind of EHR free text records. Uh, and that same kind of thinking can be applied to uh, to psychiatry records, which are largely free text uh, and difficult to uh, difficult to work with from a kind of computational standpoint. But again, on, only recently have become more tractable to to do that. So, what we're doing is partially looking at large existing phenotypic data sets. Uh, some of those come from the NHS. Some of those are, are here in the United States, and uh, building deep learning and machine learning models on top of those data sets to better understand, again, and, and build these models around medication response, depending on phenotype. And then we're also, so that's kind of how we're bootstrapping this model. And then the way we view our direct consumer offering is that really as every patient goes through the cycle of our treatment process, the models that we have improve uh, and build upon each other so that we're kind of building this data flywheel, really a real world clinical trial using this tool, using the data that we have to better inform treatment. So what, what's a specific, what drug, what uh, condition, what, you know, have you gotten any traction yet and what are you doing? Yeah. So, you know, kind of a specific use case for what we do would likely be, you know, I think it kind of breaks down into two big categories. One is folks that have tried antidepressants before and found that they didn't work. So over 50% of people in the United States who try and depressant end up discontinuing prematurely due to side effects or lack of efficacy. And the big reason why, again, is because there's so little data guiding treatment. It's such a trial and error process. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, 
researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. With so little data involved in care decisions at the first line. Again, and no fault to the psychiatrist, but really in greater fault to the system and the fact that we just don't have more data and infrastructure is not in place to guide those decisions. So for that person, you know, again, for people who have not been successful and on, to, and on an antidepressant before, now when they show up at our door, we will not only have their genetics data to guide more informed dosing decisions and to rule out medications that are genetically incongruent, but now we'll also have data about hundreds of people that look like this person before and how they ended up responding to different antidepressants so that we can shortcut the treatment cycle and say, you know, instead of shooting darts at the wall blindfolded, like we're shooting darts with our non-dominant hand and we can better understand, you know, let's say Wellbutrin is going to be a better choice up front than Lexapro. And that decision is going to be guided by the data. One other kind of second population is those people who are you know, who necessarily haven't tried a treatment process before, but are scared of getting treatment because they know just how bad this process is. They've seen family and friends go through this process. They've seen how trial and error this process is. And they are scared of taking that leap to go get treatment. You know, not only is access so such a big question in terms of stigma, in terms of cost, in terms of provider availability, but once you're in the door, oftentimes treatment doesn't work. Uh, and the fact that data is guiding treatment makes mental health feel more like a physical health condition. And so, who, who are you who are you working with to get this in use? Do people have to come to Prairie directly, or do they have to be referred by the doctor, or how are you rolling this out? Yeah, that's a great question. So today we are live in California, and we're still largely in beta mode, but are working with our first patient cohort, and. They come in through several means. They can sign up directly on our website. We're completely cash pay because we want to align incentives in healthcare around patients. You know, healthcare in the United States is built for everyone except for patients. And with our goal of improving patient outcomes, we want to make sure that we're not building for payers. We're not building for providers. We're ultimately building for patient outcomes. So it's completely self-pay. Patients can sign up directly with us and get care immediately if that's something that they wish to do. Other channels in which people meet us are, as you kind of alluded to, provider referrals. Oftentimes therapists, uh, you know, in the United States, they don't have prescriptive authority and they need uh, a provider with an MD to prescribe medication for their clients. And we can help fill that gap. And same with primary care, where the majority of prescriptions for psychiatry written in the United States come from primary care, but oftentimes primary care physicians aren't the ones who are best enabled to provide the highest level of care for people with anxiety and depression. So that's another place where uh, we've seen a lot of excitement around the kind of tool that we're building. So what's the future of these models or do you not have enough data yet to see if they're truly effective or improving you know, patient outcomes? So, you know, looking forward, you know, again, we're still very early in building out our body of evidence uh, from our own patient population. But we know empirically the tools that we're using have strong evidence-based support from genetic testing and the guided trial and looking at, again, you know, we, with the caveat that genetic testing certainly isn't everything today. And we think that there's much advances that can be done, both in terms of pharmacodynamic markers and others. But you know, today there is strong body of evidence to say, hey, we can reduce side effects. We can reduce adverse drug reactions. Looking at care management and collaborative care management principles and the impact trial in geriatric psychiatry. Like we know we're using evidence-based practices that are intuitively aligned to improve patient outcomes and care by following up with patients every week and making sure that they're doing okay, rather than being like, hey, you know, here's your, here's your script and good luck on your prescription, see you in six weeks. 
following up on a weekly cadence ensures compliance, ensures that patients are, are being heard. And then the kind of biggest, and of course, we know telemedicine, we're a telemedicine first platform. We know telemedicine. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You know, and, and kind of following in line with the APA is, you know, equivalent but different than in-person care. And we think that it also offers additional opportunities to lower the barriers to entry for psychiatry, also improving outcomes. Uh, you know, the biggest unknown, of course, is the machine learning and how can we apply that in a meaningful way to significantly improve outcomes. And, you know, there is some interesting initial work over the past couple of years. Adam Chekrod out of Yale uh, did some interesting work in machine learning and psychiatry. There's a lot of uh, kind of novel research coming out in the computer science community around uh, extracting data and, and, and reconstructing patient timelines in psychiatry as well. I think we're still in the early stages of that of that research, but think that there's a lot of promise as far as applying that in a clinical setting. So, you know, between all these other evidence-based tools and the traction and data that we see around machine learning and psychiatry from a clinical perspective and, and from a research perspective, I think we're very excited about what the next year, year and a half holds for this population and, and some of the early data that we're going to be able to gather. So you think you're, what, maybe about a year out until you get the results of some machine learning? I, I think we're we're at least about a year out until we have a stronger understanding of, you know, the impact of this clinical decision support in a clinical population. Well, very good. Where can people find out more about uh, Prairie Health? Where should they go? So today, I mean, it'd certainly be worth talking with your doctor if you are interested uh, in seeking psychiatric help. You know, I think seeking mental health care is such a stigmatized process, and it really shouldn't be. And I think a big piece of what it means to use data to drive care and reduce trial and error is that we can make this more tangible and more physical and more quantitative than it ever has been before. So people can sign up directly. They can go to our website, www.prairiehealth.co. Um, you can also reach out directly and, and speak to someone on our website to learn more about, about what we do. Uh, it'd also be worth checking out our blog, blog.prairiehealth.co, which talks about other patient journeys and stories about how this kind of data-driven platform, uh, you know, really impacted the course of their treatment. You know, one thing that uh, we've discovered in our initial cohort is 80%, 70-80% of our population has tried an antidepressant before. And 60% of the people on board indicate that they would be very disappointed if Prairie were no longer to exist. And I think the big reason is, again, the fact that this is the first time that they feel heard in their treatment process. This is the first time that someone has looked at their data and said, I'm going to make a decision about your care based on your data, not, you know, why don't we just try escitalopram 10 milligram and, you know, let's see what happens. Well, very good, Maurice. Thank you for coming on the podcast. And I, I hope you guys make a lot of headway and uh, treatment improves because, yeah, it's just, it just seems like the, the way you described is how it goes. And, uh, doesn't seem to be working very well if over 50% drop out, you know, using those medications. Absolutely. You know, both improving access to care and quality of care is essential to move psychiatry forward. Well, very good, Maurice. Thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.